it is my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Tom Ryerson. Um, Tom earned his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Classical Studies at William & Mary, uh, followed by a PhD in analytical, analytical Chemistry from the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, Tom has since had 20 years of experience working on NOAA, NASA, NSF, and NRL research aircraft, and has served has served as the mission scientist for NOAA P3 airborne projects, um, field projects since 2004. His research has also been honored several times, including two Department of Commerce silver medals for scientific achievement, one NOAA bronze medal for scientific achievement, four NOAA outstanding scientific paper awards, a NOAA award for exceptional efforts in the Deepwater Horizon disaster, as well as the Colorado Governor's Award for high impact research. And recently, Tom was named acting lead of the Tropospheric Chemistry Program of the Chemical Science Division here at NOAA, here in Boulder. Um, so today, he's going to share with us his research using airborne data to address climate change and air quality issues connecting local emissions and global impacts. Thanks, Becky. Um, and thanks for inviting me and being persistent and polite when I ignored every deadline and, and didn't respond for about a year. So I hope to entertain you folks for about an hour today. Um, and the, the new appointment means that I haven't done any science myself probably for several years, but I'll use it as an excuse. And it's really just pretending program lead at this point. I'm not sure I can even act. So uh, today I'll, I'll talk about just some vignettes from uh, my little bunch in the tropospheric research group in the chemical science division across town. Uh, and it's not, these are kind of snapshots. Well, I'll change gears very roughly between them, but I'll point that out, You'll, it'll be obvious. And mostly it'll be weighted towards this side of the thing, which really looking at local emissions and, and chemistry impacts on the atmosphere. I'm gonna try to rubber band it at the end to do something a little more useful on a much broader spatial and temporal scale, but that's mostly pie in the sky at this point. And I think I'll skip urban sources, but you can see there's an urban source in here. So I'll start with um, just the recent snapshots, as I said and those things that have led into new chemical science division foci uh, to say that we've got more work ahead of us, we think, and then hopefully get to this point, try to stretch to more uh, larger scales. Well, there we go, so recent snapshots one, here's first gear. Um, looking at agricultural emissions, this is a very heavily studied field, and we got interested in it um, very late in the game from some stuff we did in California. So here's uh, a map of California, there's the Bay, San Francisco Bay, flying an airplane around in the boundary layer, both before and during the rice growing season. This is a big deal up in the northern Sacramento Valley. And so looking at the emissions from rice growing, um, we found that in some nice work by Jeff Peichel, we could uh, connect the dots between many, many, many different rice paddies and say we see the same thing throughout the whole Gestalt area as um, Macmillan did in a very careful study that took three years. So we can link these spatial to temporal scales with the P3 swanning through for two whole days. and. Uh, Macmillan and others um, doing it carefully for several years. So we could extrapolate a little bit there. And um, Jeff did some nice analysis using some data on methane versus CO in this example to show that, boy, the inventories for greenhouse gases in this example, rice, um, methane emissions were way off. And he could actually identify a reason for it. And we actually went and told California, hey, you guys haven't quite caught up to a legal change you instituted some years ago that just hadn't penetrated to the inventories. So pointed out a real, uh, serious need for timely updates to these inventories. They were addressing an air quality problem, don't burn your rice straw at the end of the season. So uh, the farmers would just roll it back into their fields and then it would rot and produce a lot more methane, about a factor of three, and all they had to do was connect the dots and forgot. So we could see that in the atmosphere, good for us. So that was fun, agricultural emissions. Another snippet from California, now here's LA, way down in here, we were up here before, LA down here, lots of roads, um, potential for urban emissions, mostly from tailpipes of ammonia in this example. You also have this little tiny uh, subset of, of uh, dairy cattle just over the Chino Hills, so most people have forgotten about it. So these are significant emitters of ammonia. When we fly around in the LA basin, here's a flight track in black colored by a measured ammonia from John Nowak Sims on a board. You can see the winds blowing from left to right, lots of ammonia. Um, downwind of these. And in fact, the, the emissions inventory suggests that all the combined emissions from cars and trucks in the LA Basin are roughly equal to about this concentration. But we see much higher concentrations downwind of the dairy farms, 
Um, turns out that the inventories, again, were underestimating the feedlot ammonia emissions. And this has really serious impacts on the ammonium nitrate particle concentration. So high concentrations, not just mass amounts, but concentrations emitted from a small area drive the nitric acid to the ammonium nitrate and really contribute a lot to the LA haze. The classic LA haze they've been trying to address for decades. Um, we thought that this might be another knob that they have underappreciated um, for minimizing the, the haze that keeps the mountains from view even to this date. So that was fun. Uh, another reason to think, boy, maybe we need to quantify these inventories uh, from the top down better than bottom up. And so that's led to a new focus for us. Uh, um, for instance, the, the sort of the motherhood statement here is that ag and animal husbandry, especially with the dairy cattle and whatnot, um, really drive how you do what you do, really drive the emissions of ammonia, nitrous oxide, and NO. So the nitrogen containing compounds and methane, of course, as we've shown. And these things kind of tie three of our favorite things in the chemical sciences division together, climate, air quality, and the stratospheric ozone layer with uh, N2O down here. And um, so since everybody needs fertilizers, especially in the westernized uh, countries, um, just to feed the globally growing population, we thought this was something we could contribute to. Even though it's a very well studied field, we could bring the multiple um, simultaneous yeah. measurements to it. So we could tell Farmer Joe, you know, you've minimized your ammonia, but you've suddenly maximized your N2O with this particular practice. Maybe we can help you minimize both, or at least understand what you're doing. So since the airborne studies every two years, the huge baggage train of P3 circus wasn't always the most necessarily flexible approach, we decided to take a page out of everybody else's book and put together an instrumented van. So uh, when I gave this little spiel at the Frappenstein preview, oh, I'm sorry. I told myself I wasn't going to say that, frappe. Um, we actually had a van in prospect, and now we actually have a van, actually. So the point was we could do something with this van locally in the um, Front Range region with all of our sources to do uh, emissions ratios, um, quantify the spatial distributions, variability over different scales. Because what we saw from the Calnex and published in a couple different papers highlighted here are there, uh, the emissions are really imperfectly represented in the available inventories upon which scientifically sound decisions are, are driven. So other than, um, and as I said in Frank's talk, spatial allocation, seasonality, and magnitude, the inventories look really good. So we thought we could contribute a little bit to tightening those up. So um, a couple months ago, we just showed a picture of a, a virtual van. We actually have an actual van with a lot of people contributing. Um, so we've got all the nitrogen species that we can measure simply. Uh, nitrogen oxides as well for the reactive components, and this uh, bioaerosol sensor that Ann Pairing is stuck in there just for grins. What's nice about the local region is that here's a map of, uh, you are here, there's Denver down there, and um, on the background of all this oil and gas purple dots, those are all the wellheads we know about at least, uh, there's this multiplicity of different kinds of concentrated animal feeding operations. So these things are really large sources of the agricultural emissions that we know about to the atmosphere. And uh, so we can just drive around relatively locally, and here's what we've done so far in the, in the time since I first spoke during Frappe and Discover with one van. So uh, Michael Trainer characterized this as not even a random walk, it's just kind of stumbling around. Um, we're just getting our feet wet in the van world. You can't quantify mass emissions yet from our van, but we can look at the ratios and their spatial and temporal variability. So this does look kind of random, but um, one thing we were able to do during Frappe is that uh, we actually tag teamed with a couple other vans um, to do something a little more focused up in here. So there's, I'm gonna zoom in on that part. Here's Google Earth, I don't know if you can see it. Here's Greeley. And there's the Greeley Airport right around here somewhere, somewhere, um, where the, most of the misapproaches were done in the area. But um, it doesn't show up very well, but each of these things, each of these boxes contains a pretty significant feedlot either for uh, dairy cattle, beef cattle, I think sheep, and then other cattles up here. So what we did is um, we bribed Aerodyne and uh, Mark Zonlow's group at Princeton to tag team these three things. We had vans driving sequentially for two full diurnal cycles. And it really is no fun driving at two o'clock in the morning in Greeley over dirt roads. In order to capture um, at least five different sites, and we can continue this uh, for their seasonal and temporal short scale on this one variability. And so the plan was to circle each one twice, go to the next one, circle, circle. The whole circuit took two hours. Each van did it twice and handed off to the next van. So we uh, tag teamed on each one. And you can see some of the preliminary data here. So we do emissions ratios very well, we think. So ammonia to methane and ammonia to N2O. 
I'm not showing you the methane to N2O here, but you can see what's a pretty significant potential diurnal cycle, which we never really took into account when we did the aircraft studies in California. So we're always sort of in the middle part of the day when the sun is warm. But um, taking this into better account is something we should have done, and, and now we know how to. So uh, each of these little bow ties, for instance, is the first loop and the second loop around a given thing. And this one's kind of entertaining because it's literally a square mile of cow. There's tens of thousands of, of head of cattle there. And uh, Jeff's advice after doing this once is never roll the window down. Just don't do it. Um, so we can see that uh, repeats very close in time, maybe 10 minutes apart, get a very similar number. When we did it the second night, so there's two whole diurnal cycles here, those are these bow ties up here, similar in time. It's not a big difference, but we're able to take into account some scatter about the, the measurements. And these are just the data from the NOAA CSD van so far. We, we're, it'll be really fun to add Aerodyne and Princeton in and see where we can go with this. You can kind of see some trend here. This is a, sorry, 6 p.m. local, midnight, 6 a.m., and then 6 p.m. again. So we'll fill this in with the other van data um, and see where we stand. But you can also imagine that with the this sort of trend in both these species, what's not shown as N2O to methane is actually fairly flat. And there are two different ways to do this, well, at least two. We don't know which one's attendant, but we also have measurements, um, long-term measurements at a feedlot further east and other published papers showing what the cycling is really due to. So we hope to be able to tease this apart. Scott Island is leading the analysis on our end and uh, he'll talk about this more at AGU this summer, winter. So that was a new focus, that was fun. Here's a changing gears very rapidly. Here's another new focus for us, as everybody else, oil and gas. So we did some oil and gas in California. That was fun. Decided to pursue it in uh, spades here. And the motivation again is, um, so shale gas production from unconventional drilling, so hydraulic fracturing and directional drilling enabled all this access to new hydrocarbon resources. So you can see it really blowing up um, maybe about five years ago. So we thought the big three here are sort of accessible if you park a long range aircraft in Tennessee earlier this summer and NOBADS was uh, part of that experiment with us. And so uh, we can start documenting in a way that hasn't been done yet some of the eastern fields. There's been a lot of work on denver Julesburg, right outside of our backyard in Uinta Basin in, in Utah from uh, GMD, our sister institution in NOAA. So we thought we'd put the P3 through two flights here, two flights here, only one stretched up in here. Now the Marcellus is a huge whale of an area, but most of the shale gas production, it's the largest field in the nation for shale gas production, but 75% of it is encompassed in a small area up there. So we thought we'd give it a try. So doing it once is, is no way to start, but it, it is the way we did start. Um, so we'll use the P3 data from our Cenex project last year to define these emissions and see how they stack up against the existing ones out west. So this is kind of a busy slide I'll walk you through. Here's that part of the, the world between Texas and Louisiana that's characterized by a lot of shale gas, these unconventional wells drilled into a certain uh, stratum down deep. And then all the other gas wells we know about are in light green. That's a lot of wells. Um, but the Haynesville is the one that produces a huge amount, a disproportionate amount. So the P3 came in from Tennessee and did this kind of raster box pattern, mostly in the boundary layer. And now it's colored by the uh, enhancements we, or the mixing ratios of ammonia in this scale. So purple's low, red's high. And in general, with the wind blowing from the south on this day, we can say upwind in this box and downwind on this box. You can do this um, mass flux analysis that's fairly common these days. And uh, if you look at the variability, it's not a big signal here. And that's okay. We can put an upper limit on this, not a big signal. Comparing to the downwind we saw, the concentrations here. So there's definitely more downwind as a result of the shale gas emissions. So the medians of the downwind are significantly different than the medians upwind. And so we can get a, a mass flux in the atmosphere out of this flight. And Jeff's working on that, and I'll show you the results from it. What's new to us is that um, because we flew next to this NCAR C-130 with its vertical winds um, very carefully babysat, we were encouraged enough in our own vertical wind data, which we've never touched for 20 years of doing this, to try to do a vertical eddy flux from these same data now flying over the, the field itself. Now we didn't mow the grass as extensively, but Ben Wands worked in our group with uh, Thomas Carl and um, some of the folks here at NCAR to do this uh, eddy flux analysis. So the, uh, I won't go into how things worked out, but the signal here is the difference between the, the blue void fit to the noise in the signal to the enhancements that are represented by the red data. And in fact, he tells me there are two lines on here, one green and one blue. 
the residuals from this blue to red data are here, and it's definitely skewed toward a positive number and a log normal distribution. That tells you something important about the proportion of um, large super emitters in this field versus just the standard ordinary everyday ones. So the two lines on here that are identical are the, the median from this uh, flux analysis that Ben did and the number that we got out of the horizontal mass flux, just one big pass downwind with some assumptions to it. So we're getting the same number, which is always encouraging, from two complementary analyses. It's gonna be interesting to see, so the, uh, the largest emitters, the single point sources that contribute disproportionately to the flux, aren't a huge contributor. This tail doesn't go way out like that. Remember, this is gonna be, what I'll show you is a very low emitting field. It'll be really entertaining if anybody had put a sort of instrumented aircraft around the denver Julesburg Basin a couple months ago with really good methane and vertical winds to see if a high emitting field, the local one here, looks significantly different in this population distribution. So the extent to which super emitters here contribute to the large percentage flux. So if we take all Jeff's analysis and put it a bit together, this is a bit of a summary. So the numbers we get in the atmosphere for the methane loss rate as a percent of the gas production from each of these fields. Here's the uh, Gabby Patron paper from a van driving around locally in 2008, 4%. And remember the EPA kind of grand average should be around here, 1%, making methane look like a really good bridge fuel. Um, she found 4%. Again, they repeated these with an aircraft in 2012 and got the same number. So that's denver Julesburg. Utah is significantly larger. That's Anna Carrion's paper from an aircraft flight in Utah. So to date, NOAA has gone to, to bat for very high emissions numbers from these things. Um, so Jeff's study from Cenex last year, putting upper limits on these three large fields, say, you know, it's not universally true. It looks like these eastern fields, Haynesville, Fayetteville in Arkansas, and the Marcellus, the biggest at that point, sorry, at this point production region, have relatively small numbers, and in fact, much more in line with the EPA grand average estimates. So here's the problem. We don't know why these are much, much larger than these. And we're really interested in finding out. And so, um, but if you were to try to focus on one as a place to, to drill down a little further, you may not pick Denver, Julesburg, or Uinta because their actual fraction of the total gas production is pretty small. You'd wanna make sure that you're not emitting a large fraction from the largest fields here. And so is this just simply a difference between dry fields versus wet fields? It's not the fracking underneath, but it's the processing on top. Laura, feel free to interrupt. So this is this percent lost is the, the mass flux of methane in the atmosphere divided by the total gas production. And we're assuming scales, temporal scales are commensurate. Natural gas, methane plus liquids up to maybe C5. But for dry fields, it's almost all methane up here. For wet fields, those with significant oil production, you have to do a lot more and you get methane plus ethane plus propane in larger fractions. It's, a, it's, it's not a great metric because dividing by the gas production falls apart for an oil field, for instance. And in fact, the Prudhoe Bay facility in the North Slope of Alaska is the biggest gas processing facility in the world, but its gas production is zero. So you don't have a number to divide by if you wanted to do this leak rate calculation for Prudhoe Bay. So the, the community, and we are especially still struggling with the best way to represent a percentage loss rate. So this is really applicable to gas fields only, and mixed fields become a little bigger. But dividing by the number of BTUs of hydrocarbons produced just doesn't seem to be very compelling. So we've been able to start mapping out, and I don't have a map, but believe me, mapping out the US in terms of new unconventional gas fields and their leak rate to the atmosphere in terms of methane produced. We've got some more studies planned for, uh, well, we are actually up in the Bakken with a small aircraft and down on San Juan. This one's interesting down in Four Corners, New Mexico, because it's the biggest methane hotspot, if you believe Skiamaki and GOSAT for methane in the US. It's not obvious to us that that should be. Um, and I think we'll have more data to show relatively soon about whether that is or whether it's really sourced from that area or just transported from somewhere else. We've got uh, a whole P3 project planned next spring around nothing but oil and gas. We'll be located here and in Texas to access a broad range of fields from wet to dry and see if we can figure out what the main driver is for this range of loss rates. So if it's really on average across the US, 1% or less, this is a great thing to burn relative to coal. 
simple first order thing. If methane's really leaking at the four or even 9% level, that's not any better than coal. In fact, it's probably a little bit worse in terms of climate effects. Then the last thing is kind of interesting. So we've got two studies from GMD, from NOAA GMD in the Denver Julesburg. So I didn't update this plot, but here's 2008 to 2015. It's a little future stuff. So 4% in that first study. This one says this is a completed study. It's also 4%, that's this bar. Just looking at Denver Julesburg emissions over time. This is the interesting um, test point. Hickenlooper and uh, the Colorado State Assembly stood up really stringent new regulations. In fact, we're internationally famous for this to try to ratchet down emissions from this basin. And we have um, Frappe, which just concluded, Song Next next year, which should go, and then a 16 or even 17 study with a NOAA P3 again. We have the opportunity to see if this thing took a nosedive because of regulations, just kept on going up because nobody was paying attention, or was a wash for production going up and regulations coming down, total mass emissions are about the same, who knows? So this will be a really interesting field to study over time. It'll probably be the most carefully studied to date um, so it'll be interesting what Frappe can work with to get that out. Right, Frank? All right. So uh, I'll probably change gears here. That's our summary of what we've been able to do and what we plan to do for oil and gas. Ah, okay, here's the entertaining one. Uh, a recent snapshot. We were out in the field in 2010 and somebody wet the bed in the Gulf and uh, we had this horrible blowout that is fairly famous now. And we actually got retasked to go do something with the P3. Um, what is less well known perhaps in the US is that two years later, um, this oil rig blew out now on the surface. And that you might recall is famously, it's the one leaking methane down here with a big safety flare still burning up there. Everybody bailed out because they were worried about it exploding. There was another chemically instrumented aircraft fortuitously available, so we participated in that response. And I'll tell you what we were able to do. So uh, the argument here is that these aircraft, surprisingly, can provide really time critical information unobtainable in any other fashion during offshore blowouts, and there probably will be more in the future. Um, so we were really lucky in 2010. We were already doing our thing in California when this thing happened. Um, so we were recalled to uh, the Gulf to do some flights. So here's the uh, Mississippi River Delta, Louisiana coastline. Here's the June 10, 2010 best guess about the oceans of oil on the surface now from the spill. The spill's been going on for about a month now. And we flew in with a P3 and the flight track location mostly in the boundary layer at about 200 feet to 500 feet is colored by the PTRMS measurements of aromatics as one of the thousands of things <coughs> coming out from the oil spill, making it to the surface and then evaporating. So you can see that despite the oil everywhere, we're basically at the part per trillion or so detection limit of the PTR until we get immediately downwind of the spill site. And now we see gigantic concentrations and repeatedly so. So we did this downwind pattern, bugged out to do a long survey, and then came back and did it again. Same source, same concentrations, same direction. Boy, this was really easy for us and anybody else. Um, we could apply this uh, flux analysis to quantify the total amount of evaporating hydrocarbons, and then with a key realization, we could actually calculate what's coming out of the wellhead a mile beneath the surface. Um, so if you take the atmospheric flux, that we measured directly for the things measured aboard the aircraft, all these different alkane species from methane, which was famously not coming out at all, um, to about C11. This combines proton transfer reaction mass spec and good old whole air canister samples we were taking in the plume. And you regress it against the composition, the known or even guessed at composition, because we're not real sensitive to it, of the oil and gas that's leaking out of the sea floor. You can find that some things dissolve these blue things um, before they get to the surface. And we told people what was down deep versus what was coming out. Some things make this beautiful straight line in log log space. And it turns out that any single one of these species, the line between that dot and zero, tells you the flow rate directly. As long as you can make a case that it's come out without dissolving and it's evaporated completely to the atmosphere. So that gives us a handle on the spill. In fact, we were lucky enough, we've got over a dozen compounds telling us the same number. So the as soon as we landed, we had a handle on it. The official estimate for that day in retrospect was 45,000 barrels of oil. Just guessing, I'm sorry, we got 45,000. The official retrospective analysis, 59,200. So we reported that as a lower limit. In fact, we saw more in the atmosphere than the official guess was coming out of the entire wellhead. That wasn't quite believed at the time, but then they revised it up uh, higher and higher. 
And in fact, once we uh, figured out what we could do with all the other data, we were within 5% of the official total flow rate on this day with aircraft data alone. That's pretty good because we can do this in a couple hours rather than dragging things to the Gulf and then sinking them down deep and getting access to a wellhead. And so uh, I still have to try to explain to people that haven't thought about it um, how you can do this. And the analogy is really cheesy, but bear with me for a while. If you come back to your backyard pool and your friendly neighbor has dumped just untold buckets of chicken soup into it, it's just a disaster. How much has he got in there? Um, as long as you know the recipe, the composition of this stuff, you can do a pretty good job of guessing from any one species, right? If you know that there's one carrot per gallon of chicken soup, and you go and skim the surface of the pool and you find 20,000 carrots, you can do that math. And now we've got carrots, celery, salt, spices. We don't need anything else. We don't have to count all the chicken parts to tell you that there's 45,000 barrels of oil flowing each day into the Gulf from these airborne data. So that was still a bit of a revelation. It took us quite a while to figure it out. Um, it took a, a year and a half for the paper to come out. Basically, we measure, so here's three panels. We measure the hydrocarbons up here in blue in the atmosphere. All the ones that got up to the atmosphere and evaporated, whether they're partially dissolved or completely undissolved or not yet evaporated. And from that, we can infer all the stuff that didn't make it out, the lighter compounds that are more soluble. We didn't see them in the air, they must have dissolved and the heavier compounds that couldn't have dissolved because we understand something about their chemistry, but certainly aren't volatile enough to evaporate even, though, even in the warm gulf. So we could draw this diagram and hand it to oil spill folks and, and tell them something fundamental that hadn't realized yet, that we have a good case for deep plumes making up the mass of this thing, and we can tell them exactly what's evaporated and what's in the surface slick that determine health effects to response workers or people on the shoreline days and days afterwards. So that was nice, and we were really lucky to be able to do this because we had all the measurements that we needed. Um, but it took us a while, as I mentioned. Oh yeah, and here's the last little spiel. So here's the official estimate. All you get is a total, 10,000 kilograms per day on average. Here's the chemical estimate. So these, this official one is based on physical and optical data. Little guys staring at uh, video of oil jetting out of a, of a pipe. People calculating at DOE sort of the flow that you should get with a pressure drop and a viscous fluid and a little nasty tear in a hole. But um, now we've got the third leg of this tripod. Using chemical data alone, we get an identical number from the aircraft and using some of the subsurface data. In fact, we could start parsing it and tell people where it was. So that was pretty interesting. Um, so we could actually tell them how much leaked, the total, and even more, what went where and why. And that was really key for the ecosystems managers to try to assess environmental damages. Benzene on the shore, probably not from the spill. Benzene down deep, bad for the corals, et cetera. So it took us a while, but it really laid the groundwork for doing something quickly the next time. And the next time was in the UK North Sea, and I can summarize this in one slide. Um, this platform blew out, and it caused uh, such a, a hiatus in pipelines and distributions that I'm um, evacuating it shut down 10% of the UK natural gas supply for months. This is a really big economic penalty. Um, so Total, the owner of this rig, called up uh, some friends of mine at Woods Hole, and they called me and said, can you do that thing? And I said, no, but we know somebody in the UK that might. So I called up him and said, are you guys ready to go? And, and in fact, fortuitously, they were. They were already on the way out the door to another chemical measurement campaign. So they just turned around and did five flights within several days. They started a couple days later and carried on for a week or so. So um, we provided flight plans. We did their data analysis for them. They got a number. In fact, it started coming down over time as this reservoir was depleted because of the leak. And, and uh, uniquely in this one, in total contrast to the BP spill in the US, they were able to communicate this clearly, quickly, and in a, in a very sensible fashion with known plus or minuses on it to the, to the public. So instead of all the, uh, the surprises and the guessing for the Deepwater Horizon response here, these guys actually sounded like they know what they were doing because of the airborne response. And so, in fact, they showed that the leak weight was both low to start with. Oh, the original response estimate was it's either two or 23 tons per day. Okay, that's a big range. These guys can come in and say, here it is, plus or minus about 15%. And here's its evolution over time. So um, they changed their whole relief well drilling plan, which would have taken additional months, and said, we'll just put some very highly paid guys without smoking materials back on this rig and they can shut it in right at the, at the leak point, which they did famously and uh, restored control two months prior than expected. 
And the effect on that, so we can make a statement from this effort. Uh, we, the airborne data provided really time critical and actionable information. And that's a big deal for NOAA because um, in, aside from the environmental damage avoided from the early shut-in, aside from the, the uh, economic boon to Total, the operator for getting this thing back online earlier, just the sales tax alone and the gas restored earlier than expected was $2 billion worth to the UK Treasury. So our point is, this can be very cost effective to government to have this in their back pocket. So that the sales tax um, savings alone to the UK Treasury pays for this facility for 100 years. Seems like a no brainer, right? So this is the, uh, the horse that I'm flogging um, because people are really sensitized to the, the sort of the booming development offshore Arctic. So uh, you can imagine that dragging all the response assets that took us months in the Gulf, in the warm water, gentle Gulf, would be pretty problematic up here with ice and weather and remoteness and inaccessibility and, and so on. <clears throat> so uh, in fact, there was a National Academy of Sciences publication that identified a lot of key gaps in our ability to respond to an Arctic scenario that are addressed directly by the aircraft. It could be the only show in town, the earliest show in town for quite a while in an offshore blowout scenario. And there are lots of reasons why you want to do that. Um, Marcia wrote a nice paper that I'm a uh, courtesy author on, I think. You need to know the well intervention design. You need to know the flow rate in order to calculate that. The coffer dam that was originally placed on top of the BP thing in the Gulf got blown off because the flow rate was underestimated by a factor of about 20 at that point. They just didn't make it big enough. How much dispersant you bring and jack into the, the wellhead itself subsurface, that's a hugely contentious issue. They probably weren't putting enough soap in to make the oil disperse the way they thought um, at any point in the whole thing because they had the flow rate wrong. And then how much surface containment gear, how much boom do you have to drag to the situation? How many uh, tanker ships do you bring if you can sip off the top? Um, reservoir depletion rate, if you don't know your flow rate, one of the big panic moments in Houston was the two weeks after they shut in the well and closed it off on July 15. They spent two weeks with about three submersibles driving around at no miles an hour on the seafloor looking for bubbles. That's really slow way to find it out. They've got hundreds of square kilometers to cover with a video camera, hoping that they hadn't turned the valve on the wellhead and blown up the seafloor in a totally unrecoverable accident somewhere else. The aircraft could tell you that in three hours, whether they had a leak or not, and then so on. So there's a real need to know flow rate. There's a real need to know it quickly, repeatably, and accurately. Here's the problem though, and we keep telling our handlers in DC, don't count on us next time. Both times we had a response, we were lucky enough to have stuff already on board the aircraft. So you know how quickly people can plan, integrate, and deploy? Not very quickly. So we'll, we're gonna look like Keystone Cops the next time it could happen. So I keep reminding our folks, we don't have this, but we could. So we've spent some time thinking about it, and here's where NSF is probably gonna get the call from us right after we get the call next time if we don't do this. So you don't need a whole P3, you don't need a whole payload. Um, you need three measurements, methane, whole air samples for hydrocarbons, because you can't get around that, and uh, PTRMS to map out the shape of the plume in aromatics. And you put this thing on a little plug and play thing and do your homework beforehand to drop it into any of a range of different aircraft. Certainly not the NOAA P3s, because they're hangar queens, and they're very rarely available, but there are 30 of these, and there's an NCAR C-130 just down the street with a really big cargo door. You wheel it in, you wave your paperwork at the guy, grab and go, and then do your thing down into the oil spill and quantify it. So if you give us some time and some support, and us could mean you guys as well, you could do this thing within days of a blowout in the jargon for continental US or Alaska. So that's a really different picture that you have in the next one than you did in Deepwater Horizon, for instance. And there's other considerations down the road. So here's what we were trying to bait headquarters with at NOAA. It's an example using Deepwater Horizon leak rate estimates over time. Again, you're, we're not gonna be fighting the same battle next time, but what, bear with me here. So started at 60,000 and dropped down to about 50,000 barrels per day, just oil alone, the gas gets added onto this. And that's the final estimate, published November 2010 with lots of arguments. So here's what we could do with a quick response airborne toy we could provide within a couple days of the blowout multiple flights. So we can tell you exactly what we're dealing with and when you actually turn the screw and shut it in, we could tell you what that did. When you add dispersants, we can tell you exactly what that does. If you turn it and something else happens or there's a failed attempt to intervene, we could track that with multiple flights. Good for us. 
Anybody can do this. Anybody with an instrumented aircraft. And this is really what we're trying to sell is the world avoided. So this is famously the evolution of the Deepwater Horizon best estimates you could get at the time. Well, there's zero on day one, and there's a thousand, and there's 5,000, and we kept guessing all the way through the spill with no good number to really rely on until November 2010 when they did this forensics. Um, I don't show it, but the P3 flew on this particular day and we got that particular number. Um, so we're hoping to uh, not go through this pain the next time, and we're still looking for sufficient resources uh, to do this in an operational sense in the US. Fun. Uh, and then finally, if, is there a finally? Oh, one minute. Um, you know, I might just skip this. It ties to CCMI, so I'm just gonna irritate Jean-Francois. Uh, the reasons we wanna pursue connecting the global, the little snapshots of X, Y, Z, and T measurements in, in field campaigns to something longer and on larger spatial scales. Um, but I don't have time, so I'll end up there and you can ask me questions about this. I think that's an hour, right? Huh? My supercomputer has a bad clock. I will go through this now. Jean-Francois may wake up. So um, we've done a lot of field projects. We've done analyses with, uh, on you know, power plant plumes, on petrochemical plumes, on urban scale plumes, on emission point and area sources. And we've tortured uh, regional models um, to good effect over the last 15 years or so. But there's, in the chemical sciences division, at least in our group, we haven't done as much as we could, I think, to extend that to longer spatial and temporal scales. And here's why we wanna to try to get involved with that. So the, the uh, motivating statement here is that these um, chemistry, large scale, global scale, chemistry and climate models, they're different, um, really embody our best knowledge of the atmosphere. Um, and so they are the tools we turn to for doing AR assessment X, five now. And I'm sure everybody's pulling up on six. The problem from where I sit, and I'm not a global modeler, so maybe I shouldn't be saying anything, is that they really struggle to reproduce some fundamental properties of the atmosphere. Why should we believe them if they don't do these basic things right? And the three illustrations I've got to kind of motivate us at least are, we know the methane lifetime based on methyl chloroform loss rate measurements is something like nine years, plus or minus 10%. Doesn't get any better than that. And the tropospheric lifetime is a little longer, but what can you do? The range of CCMs, and these are state of the art, is a really large range. And you can't even tell from measurements or from diagnoses, the CCMs that do predict nine years are doing it for the right reasons. Uh, secondarily, um, so this is basically an issue with global OH, almost certainly. And um, I think Louisa pointed out that maybe it's just an issue with global cloudiness and its treatment in the models. That's really born to a chemist, so I don't talk about that. But it's a fair comment, and we'll try to address that. So um, if you can't get global OH right, you're probably not gonna do so well in ozone trends. And uh, by looking at the high altitude European long-term measurement sites, like Hohenpeis, well, that's not high altitude, Jungfrau Joch, uh, Zugspitze, and Zonblick, Jennifer Logan first, but then David Parrish has uh, dug into this with a passion. Um, the surface data for ozone, now these are, I think, annual means from 19 something to now, the models, and the GFDL one is an example here, there are two others that he's examined, really failed to predict ozone seasonality, its maxima, its trend over time, and seasonality as well. That's a real problem, because if you believe this, and some uh, backtracking to historical pre-industrial ozone levels, the error bar, I'm sorry, the, the radiative forcing due to tropospheric ozone and the AR assessments could be wrong by as much as a factor of two. That's a significant change. And we don't understand why. So it's one thing to say, boy, the ozone's wrong. It's a completely more useful thing to say, which we haven't been able to yet. Here's why. Lift the hood on the models, take apart the wiring, and understand and help them improve. So he's compared three so far. I think more are jumping on. But that's just ozone. And then finally, um, to, as a nod to our aerosol folks, uh, I'm showing two examples here from, uh, so the left-hand panel is black carbon, and the right-hand panel is organic aerosol, from surface to about 12 kilometers in altitude. And this is for around Hawaii, mid-Pacific tropics. It's not a zonal average. I think it's summertime. So on a log scale, the Aerocom model suite for aerosols is shown in these colored lines. It span about a factor of 20. In fact, they all overpredict systematically the black carbon loading at high altitudes where it's most effective in its radiative forcing role. And in fact, they probably all overpredict global radiative forcing from black carbon. 
That's a significant problem. And there's only this one precious little hippo data set from uh, Fahey's group, Shuka Schwartz published this, um, to constrain them. And so now people are looking at maybe why is, is there a missing loss process that's not represented properly in the models? Who knows? And then the organic aerosol comparison here, the same Aracom model suite of 20 some models. Now they span a factor of 200 in this region of the atmosphere. And there's no data to constrain it. We don't know which is right, if any. And so these are not large loadings if you look at the microscopic numbers, but they apply probably over a significant portion of the global atmosphere. So we're just dying to know which one's right and what's missing in the models that they're not right. And so we're really limited in, in the observations needed to assess and discriminate among these. So um, Louisa provided this. She showed it at the CCMI meeting in Boulder two years ago, I think. Um, you know, how do you challenge these models? Again, South Pole to North Pole, surface to 12 kilometers or so. And this, this example for eight different global scale models from Aldehyde, there's a huge range between them. So not much to 300 PPT or so. And where they maximize above the surface and latitudinally is quite different. And we can show this for OH. We can actually show it for uh, solar insulation. Um, we can show it for a lot of different species, including pans and whatnot. So what's a boy to do? or a girl. Um, one approach that has been used is to uh, do this hippo thing, Brit. Um, so here I think I'm showing black carbon. So as you, you're trying to reconstruct this curtain plot of the atmosphere, this little slice, the hard way from in situ data. So you fly the airplane up and down and up and down and up and down from South Pole to North Pole. And in hippo, they did this five times-ish. And you can even get into the stratosphere when air traffic control doesn't mess with you to see about that. So HIPPO did this beautiful job of trying to provide the black carbon data that I've already showed to constrain the model predictions on a really large scale. So you sample across the entire range of variability north to south. Um, but since they only focused on a relatively small subset, and I gotta say that carefully, not to irritate people that were on it, working really hard, um, we thought we'd just take a page out of that book and uh, do Son of HIPPO, or as Britt likes to call it, DIPPO. So um, Steve's the PI on this proposal. Now this is pure pie in the sky. Uh, we hope to hear in January whether this proposal submitted last January is gonna go. Um, so it's a, a NASA Earth Venture Suborbital 2 proposal. It's a five-year project. We do, just like HIPPO, the, Atlant uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic, flying an instrumented aircraft up and down as many times as we can before we run out of gas or reach an island. Um, but now focusing on Reactive gases, aerosols, and greenhouse gases, and that's kind of a vestige, really. So the aerosols to tell us which, what population survives transport. Why is the black carbon that remains there still there? The reactive gases for mostly focusing on methane, ozone, and black carbon, their short-lived climate forcing roles, right? How much is there? Where does methane really go to, to die in the atmosphere? At what rates do we see it disappearing? things like that. And then of course, this could be ideal for the uh, chemistry climate modeling assessment, right? We'd provide that snapshot in many, many, many more species than HIPPO could afford us um, for diagnostic purposes to tell, to lift the hood on the global models as it were, and try to figure out um, the processes that embed these uh, representations in the atmosphere. And of course, it's a NASA proposal, so we have a lot of satellite cowbell in there. And there are people in the audience, Eric Apel, Sam Hall, Jean-Francois, um, who are participating in this, and everybody's got their fingers crossed, we hope. So that's kind of the way we're trying to stitch across these uh, very different spatial scales with in situ observations, um, taking a page out of the pioneering HIPPO project, and we'll see how that goes. And now I really don't have any more, so fortunately we're still on time. Thanks everyone. All right, do we have any questions? It seems to me when you make a um, measurement of any trace, whatever the gas concentration, so you have to measure atmospheric stability, which is a parameter to describe how turbulent there is. Because it seems to me it's so important. Uh, the, the strong turbulence you experience, the, well, turbulence helps you to make measurement from aircraft. Um, but they also can dilute your concentration measurement. So without that, the, your error bar will be huge. 
because you demonstrated the diurnal variation, because it seems to me that is the indication of importance of uh, atmospheric stability. Oh, are you talking about the plots for the emissions from feedlots? Well, Oh, absolutely. We, we try to, so concentrations are not emissions, right? You can be very close to a very small source and you have a high concentration, and we understand that. So when we try to quantify a mass emission, as I said, it's very difficult to do from a van unless you have vertical information above it. We fly the aircraft in such a way to, to try to actually weigh the mass in the entire mix layer in the atmosphere and verify that we don't have a, a vertical gradient and additionally verify that we don't have any leaking out of the top of the boundary layer. So yes, we for a a surface emission of a non-buoyant plume or not hot plume, you rely on turbulence to bring it up to your altitude for sure. But we're aware of the difficulty of, of translating concentrations to mass fluxes. And we try to exercise the airplanes to give us that information. So I'm, I'm assuming this is an old hat analytical method. And I didn't go into the, what we actually do with the airplane to determine that. Does that answer your question? Anyone but Frank? No, there's no one else. Oh. It's more of a, I don't know, it's more of a comment. Yeah. Uh, for, the, for the people that are too lazy to come here. Uh, so. Uh, Making friends is always, Frank. I am. Um, <laughs> it's more of a comment than a question. I, I've been often, I've, I've advocated for being more responsive to having uh, an instrumented aircraft available for whatever happens. Uh, you know, it could be a wildfire. It could be, you know, a problem right. with the, uh, uh, this is a, you, you made a nice economical point for the uh, the um, uh, measurements in following a, uh, a an accident in, in uh, uh, oil and, and gas exploration type of type of stuff. Um, I would welcome you know anyone that can make an argument for that. You know I think people understand it. It's just very difficult to work the system that way. You know and 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 it's very difficult to be um, quick with with this. I mean I think. There's a lot of the resources are available, and the airplanes are sitting around for much of the year. And and if you know, and if there was a a, a mechanism in place to to find support for that, that would be uh, would be a good thing to do. Right. I'm actually. Um, so you're talking about this. My expectation is we're not going to get off dead center at NOAA and do this, and we're going to get the call in tomorrow or 10 years from now, and we'll be looking the other way, and we'll have the instrument up on blocks or people in China. And we won't be able to respond. And about five minutes later, I'm going to call you guys and say, can you do that thing? Because you have the ability, you have the aircraft, and chances are you'll have your figuratively won't be ready to respond. There's a better way of putting it. And it'll be a big scramble. But somebody will be able to do something. But it won't be optimized, and it won't be very well thought out, and it will be a big pain. So I'm actually going to DC tomorrow to, uh, to panhandle for the support for this at the International Coordinating Committee of Oil Pollution Research, I think. Um, and I've already flogged this to the Coast Guard Admiral staff. And everybody loves it. It's the best idea on the planet, and nobody has any resources to support it, which is amazing, because the cost for responding to this bill was, I don't know, um, I think it's tens of millions per day. And this is just peanuts. But right now, it's peanuts that you have to write a check for without going to this thing. So we've actually tried. You know, all the billions of dollars with a B floating around as settlement money from Halliburton, from BP, from Transocean, from everybody, is going into one of four different places. And we've poked each one of these four different places really hard. And they're all, quite rightly, written mostly for um, the Gulf of Mexico, for ecosystem restoration, and other things. And none of them have a research component um, other than oceanographic. So this is such a left field thing for most of the oil spill folks for most of the ecosystem folks, for almost everybody to date, that they, I mean, that's great, and somebody else should do it. And so far, we haven't gotten any response that's been worth uh, anything. So stand by. We'll see. So there, there are already numerous companies that s sit airplanes around um, waiting for there to be a fire so that they can you know, make money flying around it. So is there not a potential to have a commercial venture along these lines? Quite possibly, it's hard to see them making money though. So, but what you could do, so we're, we're sort of looking for support to do this little modular thing, lob it onto any number of different aircraft types and go. It would actually significantly help our day job 
So in the 10 years, say, between big oil spills, we would take this and augment it and go fly around with it. And in fact, some of the uh, CONOPS, I think that's concept of operations, has us exercising this about once every two years on an airplane that somebody else pays for, probably a Coast Guard C-130, because there's 30 of them, and go fly around making sure that you have this capability and warm readiness. We just do our normal research on somebody else's dime. And again, that's receiving, oh, brilliant, good job. So, but the oil companies could do it, and they certainly got the pockets for it. But the problem there is um, it's a conflict of interest, right? If this is a realistic number, and we think it is for the flow rate, they're now determining their own penalty. Nobody's gonna believe that. But the UK folks are pursuing exactly that. They're getting Total to give them a ton of money, not to have a separate aircraft dedicated, but to keep the 146 ready and yank it back from whatever science boondoggle they're on to do something like this next time. So that's a very different approach. And we think in the US, you know, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 is written so that the responsible party, BP in this case, is responsible. They're supposed to do this, but it never quite would be believed. But anybody could do it. NSF could do it. Um, and it's something worth thinking about because it would be embarrassing to say we're three weeks away from being able to feel the measurement if somebody called on Christmas Eve. Teresa? And I have um, some, I don't know what I would call it, ammunition for people who will be here when that happens is that we have a precedent on the National Science Aircraft NSF aircraft of having done that. Oh, yeah, and, Kuwait. Yeah, the Kuwait OFR study in 1991, and the aircraft, they instrumented the aircraft, but it's a completely different set of people there now and procedures, and so I, I suspect there would be considerable uh, resistance to the next request, but you at least have a precedent with which to try to pry open uh, right. that door. And it doesn't have to be a dedicated aircraft. EPA has one, and it flew around the oil spill for weeks, and it measured zero of everything it was measuring. It's got an FTIR uh, for doing mostly radiological accidents and other horrible things. And we thought, zero, that can't be. And they were holding it, well, excuse me a minute. Under the right circumstances. Yeah. But if, yeah. yeah. Right. But as you said, there's times when it wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. You've got to think it through from you're in the bathtub and somebody calls and somebody forgets to call you and then blah, blah, blah. you've got to connect all the dots and it's really takes some thought. But. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's thank Tom one right. more time. Thanks, everyone.